Hi, everybody. I'm Ellen. I'm an alcoholic. She said it was going to be a short introduction, but she sure caught me off guard there. <laughs> I want to thank Jane for being real nice and coming and kind of meeting us at the door. We were running late, and uh, yeah, it's nothing like it, you know, the last minute stuff. Uh, but next month, no, what's this? This is June. In August, I will hopefully celebrate 18 years of continuous sobriety in this program. And if anybody had told me 18 years ago that I'd be standing up at this microphone in front of a bunch of you guys telling it, I'd have said, not a chance, not a chance. Because see, I was going to come in here and figure out how to drink like a lady and then get the hell away from you people. Because there was a strange bunch of people in my first meeting. Um, and I never intended to go to any first meetings anyway. Um, a little bit about my, my life is that I was, my history is so unfamiliar to most people because I hear stories from the girls I sponsor of their tough childhoods and how they were beat around and went from hand to hand and had stepfathers that abused them. And I had grandparents that raised me in a cotton box. I was spoiled, I was pampered, I was taken care of. My mom um, married my dad after her first husband died. He had two pretty well grown girls and they really didn't expect to have any more children. And I came along kind of as a surprise and not only was I a baby, I was a girl. And he wasn't at all thrilled. Um, if I had been a boy, I might have had a little more interaction with him, but me and my dad really had no relationship. Uh, but my mom wanted to work, and she also went out with my dad, who was an alcoholic. And so she invited her parents to come up from the Eastern Shore to live with them to take care of me. And she also had her first husband's father that still lived with her. So I had three grandparents and me. Now, I never got a lot of interaction with other children because they never wanted me to go out there and play with those kids because they were afraid I'd catch something or learn something. <laughs> and, uh, and, or get dirty. And I was kept in the house and I, I was given piano lessons and I could read before I got into school and I knew all kind of stories to tell and it was me and, and my grandparents. And it was a pretty idyllic little life. Um, I went through school. I was not much in school. I was kind of uh, one of these um, nerds, I guess. <laughs> uh, I was the one that never got picked for volleyball, that never got picked for the sororities, that never got picked for anything, because my grandmothers dressed me the way grandmothers dress kids. You know, they never quite are up on style. And we didn't have a lot of money, so I always looked kind of like that. Um, but I went through school kind of uneventfully. Um, and didn't know what to do with myself. I was not drinking. There's no drinking going on here. I had seen my dad drinking. I, I can remember as a child watching the police bring him home. He would um, mow down somebody's picket fence or smash into some garbage cans. And in those days of no DWIs, the police all knew him by first name basis. They'd bring him home and say, Tom, sit down. And he knew all the police by their first name. And he'd try to get them to have a beer. And they wouldn't have a beer. And uh, I can remember sitting on the steps looking through the, the banister and watching the police bring my dad home. And I guess I knew there was something not quite right going on there, but I didn't understand it. My, one of my sisters, one of my half-sisters, was a very active, violent alcoholic. And she was always getting in trouble and uh, being bailed out. And um, she went through husbands. I think she's on her sixth one right now. But... Um, she was in detoxes that weren't even deep. They, well, they were like mental institutions in those days. She was at Grundy Sanitarium, if anybody remembers Grundy Sanitarium. Um, she had, a, you know, shock treatments and all this kind of stuff. But she still, to this day, abuses pills and alcohol, as far as I know. Uh, we don't have any contact anymore. But something in me said, alcohol did this to these people. I don't choose to drink. And I grew up not choosing to drink. I just didn't bother with it. I had, I was fine. I was okay. I was happy. I was doing good. And um, I even had a full scholarship to Merrill Institute. And then I met my husband. I remember he rang the doorbell one night. I was had my hair up in, in curlers and um, he was looking for me. Uh, he, I had been engaged to a fella and he uh, he and I had broken up, and my husband just got out of the service and was selling cookware door-to-door, -door, pots and pans. And he rang my doorbell and said that someone sent him, 
and I didn't know what he wanted, but he wanted to come in and talk. You know, they have all this little slick sales approach. And I let him in. I thought he was pretty cute because he just got out of service and he had, he had a real neat tan and, you know, all muscular, still had his hair. You know. <laughs> and, uh, well, I finally found out why he was there. And um, I told him I broke up with the guy and I didn't really have any interest in buying pots and pans, so he asked me out. <laughs> and we went out and eventually, two years later, we got married. Now, this sounds just wonderful. This is like the storybook happily ever after. Well, I lived happily before. <laughs> it wasn't, it was the ever after part that got me in trouble. I walked into this marriage. My husband's parents came from Poland. You can eat off his mother's furnace. <laughs> she has slip covers of sl slip covers. She irons underwear. She starches tablecloths. You know what? I, we all know somebody like this. My father-in-law sits on a lawn chair in the living room because he can't sit on the furniture. It's for company. <laughs> this is true. My husband's here. He can dash for it. Now, and this woman, who they, you know, they spoke Polish in their home. They, they ate these incredible meals, you know, with the sausage and the sauerkraut and the potatoes, all this real wonderful cooking. And he, we get married. And it's one, I just... It's wonderful. I don't know. I can write a poem. I can uh, play the piano. I can <laughs> do all kind of paint your pick. But I don't know how to shop. I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to clean. I, I literally went into this marriage zero. <coughs> My mother's advice to me said, if he does not beat you, you cannot come home. <laughs> I spent two years trying to get him to hit me. <laughs> Um, I can remember, I, I, now here's no drinking going on yet, folks. This is just plain old living. Um, I can remember I worked at the time, I would stop off at pick up uh, underwear and a steak sub because we were always out of underwear. <laughs> it kept, I, you know, it's like I did, I just did it a month ago. I don't know what's the matter. Um, and we had pink underwear and I mean, and I, di I didn't know what I was doing most of the time. It was like, you know, I said I was like a hog on ice. I just was, didn't, didn't have a clue as to what I was doing. I grew up with a Donna Reed show, with Loretta Young. I thought, I swear to you, I thought marriage was going to be, you guys remember Loretta Young. She would come out, she'd step out of these double doors with this long chiffon kind of thing on, and butterflies would fly up. <laughs> That's what I thought it was going to be like. Marriage was going to be a like chiffon and butterflies and, you know, rainbows and... Wrong. Or as my kids say now, not. <laughs> well, I tried, you know, I tried. We fought. Oh, my God. But uh, it settled down, he got used to it, and uh, I mean, you can live, a, live with a certain level of chaos after a while, you get used to it. And then we started babies. Well, we had kids in four years, so I had all these little ones, you know, three kids under four. And he was going to night school for nine years, anything to get out of the house. <laughs> so, um, it, I mean, we kind of settled down to this livable existence. Um, and I love these children. These were my playmates I never had when I was a kid. I never was out there with the children. And now I had two little girls and one boy, and I was on the floor with the Hot Wheels and the balls and the Play-Doh and anything. I mean, we were painting murals on the walls. And anyway, I loved being with my children. Then the state took them away. They call it first grade. <laughs> they have to go to school. I thought I was doing fine with them, but no, they had to take them to school. Uh, and I was, again, in a house. Now, we had moved to this huge, 100-year-old house with seven rooms and an acre of property. And I have no more excuses for why the house isn't clean. Um, I remember getting books. I would go to the library or to the bookstore and get books on how to clean houses. And I would read these books on organizational charts, and I would make my own charts with like four color pencils and uh, skull stars and great angles that, you know, who's doing what on what day. And then I'd lay down, you know, because it was <laughs> such a, you know, exhausting experience to make this chart up. Um, my husband said if, if I cleaned as much as I read about cleaning, you know, I wouldn't have had to buy any of the books. But no, you know. 
he couldn't believe there were people that actually needed books to know how to clean. You know, he, he grew up, you know, like uh, Mr. Clean with all his mom's stuff around. At any rate, I remember, I hated it. I hated doing the, the whole work, you know, the, the cleaning the toilets and sorting the dirty underwear. Oh, man. And I knew it was meant for better stuff. I just knew it. Somewhere there was better stuff for me. Now, some girls from high school called me. This was about 10 years after I graduated. And they called me and said, let's all get together. Meet for lunch, catch up on things. And I thought this was great. And these girls were friends of mine. And they were very sophisticated gals. And I met them in Towson at a very classy, elegant restaurant. And they had ordered for me a double vodka martini. And I said, it tasted terrible. But I drank it because it was really neat. You know those glasses with the little stem and you had your long fingernails and you kind of looked classy with it. Um, after that first double vodka martini, everything was fine. Everything was absolutely fine. And after two or three of them, somebody brought me home. And I cleaned that house like you can't imagine. I sang, and I cleaned, and I mopped, and I waxed, I dusted, I ironed, I put a little, you know, wash in, I fixed a great dinner. I was, it worked. It was great. And I remember, I'd tell people, I'd say, hey, you got a little shitty job you can't handle? Take a drink. <laughs> It won't bother, you'll get done, you'll feel good, it'll be fine, ain't no problem. I, di I didn't think it was, I thought I found the key to the kingdom. <laughs> I wasn't ashamed, I was telling people. My father's alcoholism was in here, you know, inherited. I believe it's inherited. I wasn't trying to get back at anybody. I wasn't trying to, to drink, to forget a, a bad childhood. I wasn't trying to escape guilt. I wasn't trying to do nothing except just kind of get through the junky, you know, the crappy jobs I had to do. I wasn't planning on getting hooked on this stuff. I just was going to like kind of smooth the way a little bit. And in four years, I was drinking right out of the bottle at 6.30 in the morning. My husband did not know what to do with me. He did not know what to do with me. I would come to, often, by this, I mean, in two years, I was like blacking out, being unconscious. Um, he would come home from work, and I would be, as, well, asleep. Huh. I would be out cold on the sofa. <laughs> and I'd look up, and when you got a six-foot Pollock standing over you, kicking the sofa, saying, where are the children? And you have no idea. You don't even know what time it is, what day it is, you know. And I was no more frightened than some, or no less frightened than some of these guys that the, the cops are banging on the car window when you come to, you know. He was, you know, real important to me. My marriage was real important to me. I didn't know what I was doing. I did not know how to stop. I tried, I swear, I tried to stop drinking. I marked calendar days. I still have these calendars. I think we all have some kind of history that where we've tried it on our own. I mean, I would mark this big black square on the calendar and I'd write D-Day. God knows what that meant. D-Day, drunk day, dry day, who knows? But it was D-Day. And that was going to be the end. And it, of course, never worked. I, um, I remember, I think the longest I went was 11 days cold turkey. And I'd usually be coming off of like a three-day drunk, and I would cold turkey it. And then, you know what you see is the, um, the billboards that you never see before? You know, they like sprout up like mushrooms when you sober up, like Johnny Walker, gee! <laughs> and... Uh, I would watch beer commercials on television. I think, you know they don't drink that stuff. They pour it, they slide it down the bar, they open it, they talk about it, they lift it, they toast with it. They never drink it. And I never realized that until I stopped that, that summer. And it was like, at, it was, became an obsession with me. What do they do with all this beer they don't drink? It, you know, I wanted to, <laughs> and I didn't even like beer, you know? I, <laughs> I wasn't a beer drinker, but it was like, that just kind of got me. It just was, you know, like something that worried me. Um, my mom, who had um, drank with my dad, um, used to come over a lot. She, she, I don't think my mom was an alcoholic. She was just sort of an enabler. She went along with him to keep him company and keep him out of, out of trouble, I guess. Um, I would call her when I would get really, you know, out of it because I, w I had the flu. God, I had the flu more than any woman in Hamilton. And um, she'd come over, she'd clean the refrigerator. Um, do a couple loads of wash, get the kids, you know, organized, clean a few rooms, and I would recover in about three days. Um, 
And I remember this one day, I had been trying to shake it off. And I, was, I, was, I would lay upstairs in the bed and I'd always get on my husband's side where he slept because I wanted to somehow pull his strength into me because I thought, I can't do this. I can't. And I'd lay there and you know how you are when you're just, oh God, you want to drink so bad and you're shaking and you're trembling. And I would lay there and I'd swear, I'd pray, please, <laughs> our favorite, get me out of this and I'll never do it again. And, and I, but I wanted to kind of soak up his strength from his side of the bed. I thought that would help. Anyway, I uh, decided I had to go down to get a drink to taper off, and, and I did that a lot. I would run back and forth. You, you think I'd have thought enough to bring it up, but no, I, I was going down. You don't think real good in those days. I went downstairs, and my mom was coming in with a, some freshly clo um, laundered clothes she'd brought off the line, and we were in the hallway, and she kind of bumped into me. And she said to me, now she's got an alcoholic husband, an alcoholic stepdaughter, and I'm her, the light of her life. I can't do no wrong. And she looked at me and she's smiling. She's a little white-haired lady, looked like Mama Santa Claus, you know. And she said, real, real cute, she says, come on, hon, tell me what's really wrong. She thinks I'm pregnant again. I'm her only child. These are the only grandchildren she's got. And I'm barfing my guts out all day. She's sure I'm pregnant again. And in this moment of truth, I had... I said, Mom, I'm drinking too much and I don't know how to stop. Well, if I had hit her, I don't think her look could have been any more shocked. But she's a tough little country woman and she kind of gathered herself up and she says, well, why don't you go to that Al-Anon thing where they teach you to drink like a lady? <laughs> okay. I hadn't quite heard of that, but I was going to look into that. <laughs> and, of course, I didn't do anything immediately. I continued on with my pattern, which was, you know, um, drink myself into unconsciousness, puke for three days, and then reward myself for having that drink for four days, you know, three or four days, and then we'd start all over again. Um, I finally got sick enough to call in a group. Well, you all remember Tom Flanagan down in a group. Tom Flanagan would answer the telephone down there and say, Alcoholics Anonymous, what? <laughs> Hang up on Tom Flanagan. We do not talk to this man. This man is still drunk as far as I'm concerned. He sounds like somebody would answer a bar. Well, one day I was lucky enough to get a woman. I guess Tom was in the John and I got a, a Judy or somebody to answer the phone for me. And I requested literature. I was not going to any of these meetings. I heard, she talked to me about meetings. Uh, no, no, no indeed. She sent me literature, which I promptly put in my dresser drawer under my lingerie. And this was an August day, and I remember making sure my children were outside. I could see out my bedroom window to a tree in our backyard. So I got them a nice picnic lunch, and I got them herded outside, and they sat under the tree, and I gave them plenty of stuff out there to do to keep busy, so at least I'd have time to read this literature. They weren't going to see me reading this literature, you understand. They could have seen me unconscious on the sofa, but reading this literature, no, no. Um, I locked my bedroom door. I took out the pamphlet they sent me, which was Letter to a Woman Alcoholic. And in there somewhere it says something to the effect of, you have probably hidden this, waited till your family is out of the house, locked your bedroom door. And some, something happened to me when I read that. It was as if this spark of hope jumped out of that little pamphlet into me. I didn't get sober yet, but I had the conscious awareness that somebody understood. Somebody somewhere understood what I was going through. Because I did not think there was another woman in the United States of America that was doing what I was doing. This was, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a child of the 40s. I mean, we didn't do this kind of stuff. We grew up, we, we were just normal, donnery people. We didn't have these kind of problems. Well, I drank a little bit more, and finally, I made my first connection to the woman that became my sponsor. I remember 6.30 in the morning, I had already been drinking that Wednesday morning. I had checked the directory, by the way. I did get a directory with it, and the little, thin, puny directory we had in 1974. You wouldn't believe it. I still got one. And I liked some, oh, oh, happy hour? Yes, that's what I wanted. I wanted to go to happy hour. <laughs> and that was close. You know, St. Anthony's had happy hour. 
And uh, there were a couple others I like named like fog lifters because I always felt like I was in a fog. I thought, oh, great, you know. Uh, but I didn't know you could go anywhere. I thought you kind of had to go where you voted, you know, like in your precinct. I thought, you know, they just let you go where you're supposed to go. And, um, but I knew the St. Anthony's thing was down right near me. My kids went to St. Anthony's school. And, but that wasn't until Sunday. And this was Wednesday. And I didn't think I could make it till Sunday. You know what I mean. I was already drinking at 6.30 that morning when I called intergroup and I got the, you know, emergency number. And they said they'd have a woman call me back. And this wonderful woman named Virginia called me back with this West Virginia accent that you just can't believe. And she told me, she said, I'm going to meet you down St. Anthony's at noon today, honey. And I said, why? She says, because we got a meeting. I said, there's no meeting in this directory at, six, at 12 o'clock. I thought she was taking me to the priest. I thought we were going to go to confession, and I was going to have to do all this stuff with the church. She said, you be there. And I was there. Well, she says, can you not drink till you get here? I said, yes, because I realized I had enough of a buzz on at that point to last. <laughs> So we met down there, and um, Virginia uh, met me at the door, and she opened her arms, and she opened her heart to me, and I haven't found it necessary to take a drink since that day, and it has not been easy. Oh my goodness, it hasn't been easy. Um, I met, by the way, that first meeting was wonderful, because they had up there a picture of Bill W. I asked who that was, they said Bill W., and I saw an old guy sitting up there in front of the picture, and he looked close enough to me, I thought that was him. It was Paul Robinson, Paul R., and he, he looked pretty old, and, you know, and this guy looked pretty old, so I thought that was him, so I figured I'd met him. And uh, they read the steps, and um, a man was sitting straight across from me, a big, ugly guy named George, and he said to me, are you scared, honey? And I said, you're, you're right, I'm scared, yes, sir. And he drew himself up, and he said, just for today, I will not be afraid. Especially, I will not be afraid to love and believe that those I love, love me. And I said, wow. <laughs> and uh, I kind of followed him around a lot after that. He was a neat guy. A week later, after three or four meetings, my sponsor realized she had her hands full with me because I was, I could think myself into trouble real quick. She, she had me at my, in one week time, pick up my first 12-step call. <laughs> There weren't a lot of women those days, I remember. Uh, I would go to plenty of meetings. I was the only gal in there. And she had this brand new girl that was calling, and she needed me to help her. So she asked me if I'd pick up this gal out in Towson, and I said, sure. So I went and got Jerry. Now I got this girl. Um, she's got a plastic bag. She's gagging in in my car, and she's got a um, washcloth she's wiping herself with. This is August now. She's hot, and she's sick, and she smells bad, and I'm telling her about the program. Man, I've worked the steps, I've met Bill W., and I'm taking her to a meeting. <laughs> and I'm proud, you know, and she's saying, I can tell you exactly where I was on Eckerdale Avenue when she asked me this question. She said to me, how long have you been sober? And I said, one week. <laughs> and she said, no shit. You haven't had a drink for a whole week? And I said, you're damn right. And I was driving, baby. I was proud. And she was looking up to me. She was looking up to me in one week. And this is what happens when you start to sponsor, and, you know, it's wonderful. And what happens to you is you suddenly start paying attention. Just like when a child puts their hand in yours to cross the street. You don't duck between cars or, or, you know, jaywalk. You go to the corner and you look both ways and you wait for the light. And when those new girls came and put their hand in mine, I started reading that damn big book. I started paying attention to the steps. I started finding out what was, what was going on here, what this was all about, so that I could tell them. I needed to know because they were looking to me for answers. And that first week showed me. I mean, I was so proud of that. Um, Virginia didn't do a lot of step work with me. She said, get in those meetings where they have step meetings. She says, I don't know nothing about it. She says, I'm a dumb fourth grade educated hillbilly. She says, I don't know nothing about this. I open my arms and open my heart and I love you. And I just point you in the right direction. It's up to you. The rest of it's up to you. And I get to that second step into the surrender to God. And I thought I knew God. I used to pray to God all the time singing 
It was my, I don't sing. If anybody, when I was a kid in choir, they said I could stay in choir if I'd move my mouth and not actually make any noise. <laughs> because I like to sit up front there where all the kids that were in choir were. And I said I would do that. And, uh, but when I would get drinking, I would play my piano and I would sing hymns to God. And my neighbors used to point that out to me quite often. But I thought I knew God. And I didn't know any more about God at that time in my life than I knew about... If God were water, all I had done was turn on the faucet and get a glass. I had never seen the sea. I had never seen the ocean with the power and the life and the mystery and the depth that, that you know, that can transform. That's what God is like. I hadn't a clue as to what it was like. All I had was this little glass of water. I thought I knew. I didn't. And it was like, I guess when I... Decided to turn my will over to God. It was like learning to float. I remember, I never learned to swim until I was about 16. And I only wanted to do that so I could wear a bathing suit and impress the guys. I never liked the water. I still don't. We had a swimming pool when my kids were growing up. I, I didn't even own a bathing suit. I want my water to have bubbles in it, and I want it to be warm. Still to this day. But anyway, I learned to swim. And I remember learning to float. And surrendering to God is like that. It's like, I can remember I would lay back, and I'd get in a big knot. And you drop like a rock. You're, you know, bang. you got to lean back and relax and trust that water to hold you up. You know, you can't see it. You can't, you know, I mean, you don't know what's holding you up, but it's holding you up. And it's like if you can just lean back and relax and trust, you know, he's going to hold you up. You're going to float. And I would see all these people floating all around me. And I, every time I try, I'd sink. But I know it could be done. And that's what the program is. You see the people floating all around you. You know, there's winners around. You see happy faces, and you see people whose lives are put back together, and whose families are reunited, and whose health has come back. And I could see it could be done. So I figure I just keep hanging around with them, and eventually I'm going to float. You know, and I did. You know, it kept coming, hanging with those winners. Find somebody, somebody who has what you want. And sometimes I go to meetings. There ain't damn one person in there that has what I want. I go to another meeting. You know, there's plenty of meetings around. I remember you. In the old days, old days, geez, you think I was really old here. Uh, some of the guys are sitting around with their pillows. They you know, bring their donut pillow with them because they're recovering from their hemorrhoid operation. This old guy ain't got no teeth, and this one just had uh, a gallbladder out. And then they say, "Honey, if you want what we've got." I... <laughs> I was 34 years old. I didn't want what you had. Okay. Then my sponsor, I says to her, now what do I do? I, you know, I've turned my life over to God. And she says, um, and I had a little business I was trying to get going. I had done, I was a closet poet. We're all closet poets, aren't we all? We're, we're just all emotional, wonderful people in here. And we've got such romance in us and, and passion. But I wrote these poems and I keep them in a little book. And I never let anybody read them. Um, and I, for my sponsor, I gave her a present of a poem on her anniversary, first anniversary that, that she celebrated after I came in. But I didn't want to give it to her just typewritten or, or handwritten. So I had gone to a year of art school, and I remembered calligraphy. So I taught myself. I went back and got my books out and got calligraphy. And I did her a little poem on calligraphy, and I gave it to her for her anniversary. And she loved it. She says, this is what you ought to do. She says, this is good. She says, go do this some more. And I'd say, and I'd, I'd be doing, you know, the third, one, two, three steps for the beginners groups, and I'd be doing um, the prologue here and there, and giving it away. And then people would say, I'd write a poem, and they'd say, well, hey, you wrote something for a graduation. Can you do something for retirement? And I'd do that. And little by little, the, the stuff started coming in. And then I says, Virginia, this is working good. And she says, and she'd say stuff like, just give it away to keep it. And I'd think, what? I can't give it away and keep it. She says, you figure it out. She always used to do that to me. I go to her with some problem about one of the girls I was sponsoring, or one of the girls that was, and, and I'd say, and she said, and I said, and she said, blah, 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 you know how we do. And she says, the more you stir shit, the worse it stinks. <laughs> yep, yep, I'm glad I called Virginia. <laughs> but that's the way she'd sponsor me. She'd give me this hillbilly wisdom. Mm. Some of us are sicker than others. And I never knew she meant me or them. But she'd say, so she says, give it away to keep it and figure it out. So I decided, okay, there's lots of schools in our area. I will go to these schools. I will teach calligraphy to the kids in the school. I'll go to like the Catholic schools. The Catholic schools are the only ones that would have me, actually. So I would go like to Notre Dame and IND and Catholic High. And I would take the art class for the day for this nun. And I teach them calligraphy. And when they say to me, what's your charge? I didn't even know they were willing to pay me. 
You know, I thought I had to do this for nothing. I just said, I want the girls to hear my story. And the nun would go, hmm? And I, but I just a little, little bit told them how that they can change their life. They can do it. it. No matter what, no matter what's going on in your life, you have the power to change it. If you, if you want to know more, we can talk. You know, lots of people get caught up. You know, I didn't get into a heavy thing, but how, and a lot of, the, I ended up with a lot of calls from these girls. I gave them my business card, and actually I'm hoping these are high school girls. I'm going to get wedding invitations to do. But I got girls calling me. They needed Alateen. They needed, um, you know, al -Anon or their parents did or whatever. Or some of them needed AA. And we, you know, I, I made up made some contacts and it was great. And one day this man calls up and says to me, can you do names on diplomas? And I said, yes, I can. Never had before, but I thought, well, he says, well, do you know a style of lettering called cloistered black? I said, oh, sure. Never heard of it. Stop when you work for the government, of course you work for the lowest bidder. I mean, you know, you are the lowest bidder. They don't even think about that. But um, the thing is, doors opened. I mean, Evening Magazine came and did a story on me. Our little local newspaper came and did a story on me. The Bel Air Road Booster and the Parkville Reporter. And suddenly, my business is blooming. And this is cause of giving it away to keep it. The principles of this program work. These little slogans that you hear till you feel like you're going to go screwy, the reason they say them is because they work. Um, I worked through the steps as best I could. I was running my little business and doing, running my life. My inventory, when I got to that fourth step business, that inventory thing, I didn't like a whole lot of that because I never did anything. I never felt like I had done anything particularly worth confession. You know what I mean? I mean, I went to confession at church and all. But, um, and I took my inventory like in bits and pieces. I would take it with people that I thought I could trust. Like, okay, this woman looks like she has kids and she maybe yells at her kids so I can tell her. I, I yelled at my kids. And this one looks like maybe she, you know, so it's like I would just, that's kind of the way I did my fifth step, you know. I didn't write nothing down. I just kind of went around trying out people, seeing if they would gasp, grasp their heart and drop down. Nobody did. Finally, after a lot of pain, uh, I ended up taking a real fourth and fifth step with one of the girls I sponsor. My sponsor at that time was having a really hard time, and she just didn't have time. And one of the girls I sponsor, I told her, I called her up one day, I says, "Hun, go to a meeting with me. She says, okay. I says, and she had like, I had, I guess, about 10 years by this time. She had nine, so it wasn't, uh, I says, I'll take you to the meeting if you uh, hear my fifth step. She was like delighted, you know, yeah, so one of my sponsors with the step is wonderful. It was boring as hell, but, you know. The neat thing is, she said to me, okay, now what are you going to do about it? I thought, slap you, that's what I want to do about it. <laughs> but, um, I was ready, you know, I found my emotional defect, I mean, my, my character defects. I wrote them down. The selfishness, the self-centeredness, the um, ego, the pride, the stuff that we all hide behind. We're just lucky enough to have, I mean, we all hide behind if we're born. Um, we're just lucky enough to have this program to help us, you know, hold up that mirror so we can see it. Um, and I was ready. I was fed up with living the way I was living. And I wanted God to remove these defects of character. And, you know, getting ready is, is what, people think that sixth and seventh step are, are together. And in a way they are, but it's like moving and getting ready to move. You know, I mean, when you get ready to move, there's a lot of stuff you got to do. You got to gather up all your possessions. You got to figure out what you got, what you want to get rid of, what you want to keep. Um, it's, and just kind of inventory what you got here. And then moving's another whole ball game. You know, you gotta get the truck, you gotta, you know, and then figure out where to put the new stuff you got. This is kind of me, the sixth and seventh step, is that you, you get ready to move, and then you move. Now, when God helped me move, <laughs> oh my, I wanted patience. Guess how you get patience? You get people that are impatient in your face all the time, and you learn patience. You want to learn how to be, um, have sense of humor. He's going to put you in embarrassing situations until you learn it. I have embarrassing situations you wouldn't believe. Here's one. This is usually there's somebody in a room when I'm speaking that says, "Tell the car story." Well, I had about. Um, Oh, gee, my kid was, my son had just got his first car. It was a Javelin. I don't know what year. It was a Javelin. You guys know what Javelins are. They're hot cars. This had putty all over it, you know. 
we had threatened we would make a planter out of it if you didn't get it on the road. You know, it sat in the driveway for so long, I was going to put geraniums in it. But one day, he had, did, did have it running, and uh, he, uh, I had to get to a meeting, and I didn't have my car wouldn't work, and he said, you could use mine. And I said, oh, okay. He gave me the keys, and I got in this car. My kid was 16. There's beer cans all over the back seat. The, I got the putty. This thing looks like a Dalmatian. It's got a Confederate flag flying from the antenna. It's got Born to Run etched on the rear, the side view, the side mirrors. And it's got a sign hanging from the rear view mirror that says, Gaius, Grace, or Aeus, nobody rides for free. <laughs> I'm going to my meeting. <laughs> now, listen. This is not bad enough. I'm willing to be humiliated this far, and I'm going to park way down the end of the parking lot so nobody has to see this car. God says, no, 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 no. We're not done with you yet. I can't get the key out when I get there. I don't know about this thing with a little secret button you got to push to get the key out. And I have, you know, I just recently found out why they have this. Up to this point, I thought, I never had a key fall out of ignition while I was driving. What's the point of this? You need to have a little secret button to keep people from getting the key in the ignition, it seems to me. But anyway, I cannot get the key out, so I can't leave the key in the car. i got to go in the meeting, and i got to tell the guys that I can't get the key out of the keyhole of my car. And they're thinking, stupid woman so four of them come trooping out to the car and point out everything about this car and ride it you know and so it's it's wonderful it's just wonderful to be humiliated into a sense of humor you know and I have come to laugh at everything you have to laugh at everything or if you don't you're going to get so serious so we were so serious my husband and I were so serious the first year oh this is good <laughs> the first year I got sober he didn't first of all he didn't like me going to these damn meetings where all these men hugged me then like this he went two or three times with me they thought he was a drunk and I was bringing him <laughs> did not set well they asked him where the bathroom and the literature was no he didn't know uh, and then, uh, so he decided to let me run my own program. But right before my first anniversary, I, he had said, what do you want for an anniversary present? I said, I want you to quit smoking, because you're, he's smoking three packs a day. And uh, I said, I'd like you to live just long enough to see our children grow up. So.